Hi, it's Mike Bird here. I thought I'd give a, a reflection or a bit of a bit of a trip down memory lane on a book I wrote many years ago, interacting with Bart Ehrman in association with some colleagues. The year was 2013, okay? And I was walking through the SBL bookstores where I saw at the Harper One stall, I saw a advertisement for a forthcoming book by none other than Bart Ehrman on this volume, How Jesus Became God. And when I saw that book there, my heart, instantly skipped a beat. I instantly shuddered because I knew in the coming months and years, I was going to be receiving emails and questions and queries from Christians from all over the world, where they were being confronted by Muslim apologists, uh, Jehovah's, Jehovah's Witnesses, or the new atheists who had been reading Ammon's book and were now assaulting them with questions they didn't feel qualified to understand, and they were then throwing them back on me. I mean, this has happened to me with several of Ehrman's other books, where I get questions from people all over the world about, you know, is this true, or is it half true, is it mostly true, what should I say to this? So when I saw that, when I saw the, the, you know, the, the book in question, you know, my heart kind of went, oh, there's going to be so much uh, hard work, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be good to maybe get in front of it. What if we could uh, write a response to, to Ehrman? I had a reasonable idea where he was going with it. It would be good if we could write a response to Ehrman uh, that came out around you know the same time as his book was coming out, a kind of like a real-time response. And so I, I pitched the idea to Zondervan and they thought I was kind of crazy. Uh, but crazy in a way, kind of like a fox with a PhD from Oxford University. Uh, and, and we did. So we we approached our Harper One and we said, look, we'd like to write a response to Ehrman's book as it comes out. And it just so happens that Harper One and Zondervan, who, who I went with, uh, they're both owned by the same uh, parent company, which is Harper Collins. So it was kind of an in-house Harper Collins thing. Uh, and they were happy to do that. And also with Ehrman's blessing, uh, they let, let me see a pre-pub uh, copy of the book. So I assembled a team of what I would call Christological Avengers, if you like. Uh, that was Chris Tilling, Simon Gathercole, Craig Evans, and Charles Hill. And we got together and we decided we would all write uh, responses to certain parts of the book. Uh, and we did it. Uh, and this is, this is the amazing part. From the moment we pitched the idea to writing and publication was 100 days. I mean, one, I mean, that is, that's in terms of like, you know, the publishing industry, this is, this is, this is, pretty, this is pretty fast. This is, this is breakneck speed. Uh, okay. So that, that itself was quite uh, an accomplishment. There was also a real funny article in Publishers Weekly that noted that, you know, Bart Ehrman's book was coming out, how, uh, Jesus Became God, and we had our own book uh, called How God Became Jesus, you know, punning on the title. The idea was from Charles Hill, great idea, and Publishers Weekly said, you know, um, Harper Collins is having a bet both ways on the divinity of Jesus, and our, our book, as I just mentioned, uh, which came out in response, How God Became Jesus, um, yeah, that was our attempt to respond to Ehrman, there were some good you know, things in the lead up. I uh, wrote an article for Christianity Today, kind of you know, uh, contrasting my own journey of faith, skepticism and academia and Jesus with the sort of the narrative that Bart weaves into his telling of how he came to groups with a certain view of Jesus. In the aftermath, I had the pleasure of debating Bart Ehrman down in New Orleans at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. That, that, was, that was great. Um, Ehrman is, is you know, quite, can be quite feisty on the podium, uh, but he's very cordial and polite in person. So it was you know, good to meet him you know, in the flesh. And uh, that was a fun event. I, I, I don't think I was the usual opponent that um, Ehrman uh, debates. Um, I'm, I'm primarily a comedian whose uh, conduit or platform is biblical studies 
Uh, so a mixture of humor and a type of rapid recall of facts uh, was probably not what uh, Ehrman was, was used to. But anyway, I had fun. I think the audience enjoyed it too. And you can see the debate on you know, YouTube if you like. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of fun. The comments on Bart's page where he posted it are, are kind of uh, hilarious. Um, the other funny story about the book is uh, you may have noticed that the two books have kind of a similar similar name, um, How Jesus Became God and How God Became Jesus. I saw in one of the Amazon reviews that someone um, had attempted to buy Ehrman's book, but accidentally bought our book instead, and they were none too impressed about it, let me tell you. And that their review was, was quite uh, hilarious. Um, you know, since then, I've kind of kept on with some of the Christology stuff. I mean, I've always done a little bit of Christology. I wrote a book on, you know, did the historical Jesus think he was the Messiah? That's called Are You the One Who Is to Come? The Historical Jesus and the Messianic Question. I've also written on uh, the Messianism of the Gospels. Uh, Jesus is the Christ, the Messianic Testimony of the Gospels. So I think Messianism uh, is a very important category for understanding early Christology, the level of the historical Jesus and the early church. And I mean, and there's some bastions of scholarship that try to minimize the messianic aspect and say, well, it's just a, a general honorific title. It's not really connected to all that Jewish stuff. And that, of course, you know, um, is very good if you have certain interests or certain um, intentions in uh, Jewish and Christian interfaith relations, but I just don't think it works historically. Uh, the other thing I did in the follow-up to writing the book uh, in response to Bart Ehrman is I kind of did, did my own sort of thing on this called uh, Jesus the Eternal Son, uh, Answering Adoptionist Christology. One of the claims Ehrman makes, and it's not unique to him, is that the earliest Christology was kind of like an adoptionist Christology, whereby Jesus was a human being who then becomes divine, becomes the son of God uh, at his resurrection or possibly his baptism. I think I demonstrate quite successfully, well, in my opinion, uh, that that kind of view doesn't really emerge until the late second century. And some of the, uh, the texts in the New Testament that are trotted out to, to prove that, like Acts 1, 3 to 4, Acts 2, 36, I don't think they actually say anything adoptionistic uh, at all. So that, that's kind of what happened in the aftermath. But you, you might be wondering, why am I reminiscing like uh, this? Well, a, a few reasons. Um, First of all, uh, recently, uh, Ehrman on his blog, uh, which is called Christianity in Antiquity, CIA, a uh, great name for a blog, um, he reposted his response to um, our response to uh, his book. And um, yeah, he basically says, look, you know, they, they don't have much historical evidence for their view. Uh, they're really just based on theological assumptions and that type of thing. And yeah, and he says, we don't offer a credible alternative narrative. Well, I mean, that is kind of true. We don't go around trying to offer a complete and alternative narrative precisely because they already exist. Other people have written their own alternative narratives, whether that's, you know, the, the German scholar Bousset, uh, scholars like James Dunn and Morris Casey, each in their own way, argued that Jesus does not really get regarded as divine until you get to the Gospel of John. Then you've got scholars like Richard Borkham, uh, Larry Hurtado, others who have slightly different views of arguing that, that there was a uh, early high Christology, if you like. And yeah, our main thing uh, was to contest elements of what Ehrman was saying, like Jesus's view of himself, that Jesus had an elevated or divine view of himself. I mean, Craig Evans does a terrific job uh, really, I think, demolishing uh, Ehrman's arguments about crucifixion and burial traditions. Uh, Simon Catacolt uh, does some good work on uh, pre-Pauline traditions and what they say and what they don't say about Jesus. Chris Tilling does an excellent job, too, looking at, okay, what is Paul's Christology really about? Because Ehrman believes that in Philippians 2, 5 to 11, the so-called Christ hymn, that it depicts Christ as an angel who comes to earth and then gets kind of super elevated, uh, Tilling writes in response to that. Charles Hill does some great work talking about the making of orthodoxy and heresy in the early church. So at one level, we were kind of nitpicking or just picking a few areas which we thought were less convincing than others. Uh, but we didn't need to set forth an alternative narrative because there are already alternative narratives uh, out there, many of which uh, Ehrman himself uh, 
uh, ignores. He, he never really engages with the work of Richard uh, Borkham, for one. There's one mention of Larry Hurtado. Um, so, yeah, it's easy to beat the uh, opposing team uh, if you leave their best players off the pitch. So, yeah, I, I thought, you know, you can say, well, we didn't offer an alternative narrative, but Herman, to be honest, ignores the alternative narratives that were around, and he largely plays against, uh, and this is sort of his thing, he sort of plays against the uh, somewhat naive fundamentalist assumptions about Jesus and Christology and the early church. So yeah, that's what the, that's what the whole uh, books were about. That's what they happened. Uh, I'm continuing to do more stuff in the Christology space. No doubt, many of you you know would know that already. Uh, I'm doing a big book on Christology in the context of the Greco-Roman world, and as a result of that, I have to confess, I have simultaneously softened and hardened in my response to Ehrman. Uh, one area where I, I think I should have given Ehrman more credit uh, is the idea that in the ancient world, there was different ways of being divine. I mean, when it comes to being divine, it's not like a, it's not like a rapid antigen test. It's not like, you know, positive or negative. There are different ways of being divine. And one thing I think Ehrman does, does uh, ask, he says, the church regarded Jesus as divine instantly, particularly on the basis of his resurrection. The question was, in what sense was he divine? Was he divine in the sense of a deified emperor, like a, a patriarch, like Enoch, who ascended to heaven? Was he divine, like some um, figure of Greco-Roman mythology, like Hercules, or, or something like that, or, or like some sort of angelic figure, like Melchizedek from the Qumran scrolls? Um, I, I, the more I've studied this in the primary sources, the more I'm convinced Ehrman was definitely right. Uh, it's not like he was Jesus was a human being, and then later he he became divine. Now the church regarded him as divine, pretty much from the beginning. The question was in what sense. So I've softened in my approach to Ehrman on, on those areas, but where I've hardened, uh, in my view, is that I think you can uh, you can you can show a very strong and absolute sense of divinity certainly precedes the fourth century. And what I do in my forthcoming book is, is, is I look at the different types of divinity, and then I try and map on some of those uh, more absolute claims to divinity do appear to be pretty early, certainly in inside the first century. Now, this will be a little bit contentious, and you'll have to, you know, check the receipts I offer, uh, so to speak. But, but I think I've been able uh, to show that. So that's some area where I've both grown in my appreciation and, uh, and equally uh, increased in my contempt uh, for Ehrman's uh, original volume. Uh, I don't know if Ehrman's writing uh, any more books on Christology these days. I think his next thing is on the Book of Revelation. I'm sure that will be interesting as well. But yeah, for, for people who want to get back into the debate, go read Ehrman's book, go read our book. You know, I'm now doing a podcast and vodcast called Nazareth Nicaea, looking at all things about early Christology. People may like and appreciate that. But that's pretty much all I have to say. I thought this was a good sort of trip down memory lane talking about a book that is, oh my gosh, getting close to being 10 years old, can you believe? But anyway, that's enough from me. Thanks for listening and uh, yeah, keep watching the channel and hopefully you can hear from me again, talking on some other topic if you're into that kind of thing.